Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Book of Lost Tales. So last time we got uh, right up to talking about the mythology for England. So we're going to start that tonight and then get into the music of the Ainur and look at the Valar and the uh, first discussions of the children of Iluvatar. So uh, we have a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. I'm going to try not to get too much further behind. Um, but first, before we launch into things, I want to make sure to you know, welcome, especially those of you who are new with us. If you haven't joined us live before, please do notice that there's a, a, a box for your questions there on your control panel. Uh, so if you enter your questions and hit return, then I will get those in real time so that I can, if you have observations to make about the passage we're discussing, or if you have a general question you want to ask, um, I very much encourage you to do that. I'll be uh, tracking those as we go through. And there are also two ways by which you can kind of uh, participate uh, in um, conversation with your fellow students uh, and sort of continue on the conversation after class as well. One of those is through our Mythgard Academy chat window. So if you go to mythgard.org, M-Y-T-H-G-A-R-D.org, and uh, click on the uh, the the Mythgard Academy tab and the page for this class, you will find the little bouncing icon for our chat window. Um, so, uh, and uh, then there will be some, uh, there are certainly some people there now uh, from among our curtain students, so if you want to be able to, uh, to chat with some of the other students during the class, you're welcome to do that. Um, and we also have, as I announced last time, our new discussion forum. Um, uh, related to the Mythgard Academy. So again, if you go to that page, you will find also there a link to uh, the discussion forum. You have to, you do have to register. You have to uh, create a username uh, and password to use the discussion forum. Um, it, we have to protect it to make sure that none of our uh, mysterious robot enemies are able to uh, to access it and do. Uh, uh, malicious and horrible things with it. Um, so anyway, so you do have to register, but uh, you only have to do that the once. Um, and um, and then you should be all set. So anyway, so that's uh, that's uh, do uh, do look into that. There have been uh, one of the reasons we added that was that uh, over the last couple of classes that we've done, I have received a number of really long and thoughtful emails from people as they're sort of thinking through things related to the book that we're discussing, and there hasn't been a really good place, um, you know, for those. Sometimes I'm I, you know I've been able to. You know, work the discussion in class around um, to the topic of you know what the student was writing about. Sometimes not, um, and you know, many times I've been thinking, you know, gosh, it'd be really great to have a place where people could post this stuff and uh, and even you know engage in a in a more prolonged discussion on that. So, we have that in place now for this semester, and I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty excited about that. So, okay, enough um, preliminary business. Let's get back to the Book of Lost Tales. So. The mythology for England. Um, this is probably a phrase that you may have heard before in connection with Tolkien. Tolkien saying that he wanted to write uh, a mythology for England. Now, a couple things that um, uh, that I want to sort of clarify about that. One is the time frame. Um, often people will sort of, uh, if you've heard that, you might have also heard the qualification. By the time he wrote The Lord of the Rings, you know, don't you, it, it's not accurate to think of The Lord of the Rings as Tolkien writing a mythology for England, because by the time he got to, you know, that stage in his life, he says he had abandoned the idea of writing a mythology for England. Um, so that idea is, you know, still kind of floating around, but, you know, it's, it's not any longer accurate to look at either The Lord of the Rings or the published Silmarillion as uh, you know, examples of Tolkien's mythology for England. Well, the Book of Lost Tales is the time period when he was very actively thinking in terms of writing a mythology for England. And I want to be looking, it's one of the things that I think is really fascinating to explore as we look at the Book of Lost Tales, is to sort of see what that means exactly. One thing um, to sort of keep in mind is that when, he's, when, when he talks about writing a mythology for England, he means it quite literally. Not a mythology for the UK, not a mythology for Britain, a mythology for England specifically. And what he meant by that are sort of two things. One is that uh, there, he, he always, you know, he says that he always felt sad, and this is, you know, this, uh, the portion of this letter was quoted by Christopher Tolkien um, in uh, his commentary on chapter one in the Book of Lost Tales. 
um, you know, that he always felt sad that England didn't have any native mythology, any native fairy stories of its own, really connected with its languages and with its soil. That is, all of the mythological stuff that you get in England is all derivative. Derivative of either the Norse stuff, like it's borrowed from the Norse, or it's borrowed from the Celts, or it's borrowed from the French. And there's, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing surviving um, that is that is really native to England. And Tolkien felt the lack of that and wanted to fill the lack of that. And the thing there that I would emphasize is that that in particular, the connection with fairy and the fairy tradition, that there was no, you know, almost all of the fairy stories, some are Celtic, many French, um, that, they, that they have uh, in, the, in the English tradition. You think about it, even King Arthur, who is, if anything, the English, you know, uh, mythological figure, um, still the majority of the Arthurian tradition uh, that they had um, in the traditional English was French. It was mo mostly written by French writers or, or sort of inspired by French writers. I mean, even, uh, you know, Sir Thomas Mallory, one of the greatest of the, of the English Arthurians, was in his own terms explicitly translating from French books. You know, his uh, Mallory is throughout his work always saying, as the French book saith. Um, now, you know, sometimes he's translating and sometimes he's not translating really closely. But, but anyway, nevertheless, that that's that's the lack that Tolkien wanted to, um, that Tolkien wanted to fill. Now, Sarah asks, if you get rid of the Celts, the Norse, and the French, who is left in England? The Anglo-Saxons. Those are who are left in England, and that seems to be really primarily what Tolkien had in mind and the place where he felt um, that there was a, that there was kind of a kind of a gap there um, and again we can see him and I was just talking about this this past weekend at the Beowulf launch party we can see Tolkien trying to sort of fill that gap in some different kinds of ways in some of his other works um, one of the thing one of the one of the impetus impeti uh, of the Fall of Arthur, which was published last year, is to write an, an, an English, that is to say, an Anglo-Saxon um, uh, Arthurian story. Um, and uh, so he writes an, you know, a Fall of Arthur in alliterative verse, which is designed, again, to be more of that, uh, you know, more, more of an Anglo-Saxon Arthurian story, not a French Arthurian story. Um, we see him in Beowulf, uh, in, and thinking about Beowulf in particular, the, the, the thing that I am most fascinated um, by in uh, the, the Beowulf, which was just released, uh, is the inclusion of Selic Spell, um, which is Tolkien's attempt to write the sort of purely legendary, or sort of the fairy, the fairy tale version of the Beowulf story. You know, he talks... Um, you know, uh, Tolkien talks at length about how Beowulf, the poem that we have, is an intermingling of two different elements. You have the the fairy elements, the legendary elements, the sort of mythological elements, and then you have the historical elements. Um, you know, for the history of Denmark and you know the history of the of the the nation of the Yeats and all of that. Um, and those two things are superimposed together, and the combination of those two things gives us the poem Beowulf. So in Selic Spell. What he's doing is sort of a, a kind of a thought, a sort of a creative thought experiment. So much of what Tolkien did um, uh, in this kind of work, stuff like uh, the Beowulf and uh, uh, and Fall of Arthur and um, uh, Sigurd and Gudrun, is kind of a creative, scholarly thought experiment. Um, so he 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 writes a a, a sort of a, a a stab at what the purely non-historical, but the pure fairy tale version of the Beowulf story would look like. It's really cool. It's really interesting. Um, so this is the, that's that's the kind of void that he was wanting to fill, and that's we, you know, we see in that you know in, in some other ways how he's trying to do that. But the Book of Lost Tales, this stuff, this fairy stuff that he was writing, and in particular um, with Ariel coming, this man who comes to Tol Arisea, and hears these stories um, and is going to either participate in the later history of the elves or at the very least bring these stories back. They're, you know, they're, they're sort of his ideas about this change a lot um, and untangling what his intentions were and how that what that story meant is uh, um, gets, gets, you know, where Tolkien is planning to head with it. 
gets really complicated, um, as Christopher Tolkien explains in Volume 2 of the Book of Lost, Lost Tales in the chapter called Alf Winna of England. However, um, you know, the, these, these stories, this, you know, that it, not only the tales themselves, but the frame narrative of the Cottage of, Lo of Ariel and the Cottage of Lost Play, um, this is right in the heart of Tolkien saying, I'm going to write a new mythology, a mythology for England, which will root um, English history and English uh, language and traditions with these fairy elements. Um, but, um, so, okay. Um, I want to I want to look at a few passages here to sort of see how this works. We're going to come back to this um, at times when we discuss as we discuss chapters two and three as we move on. Um, but first, some uh, some some stuff from from chapter one here. Um, let's lay out. This is Christopher Tolkien explaining things. Um, let's make sure we get all of this sort of on the table here. Later, his name changed to Elfwina, Elf Friend. The Mariner became an Englishman of the Anglo-Saxon period of English history, who sailed west over sea to Tal Arisea. He sailed from England out into the Atlantic Ocean, and from this later conception comes the very remarkable story of Alfwina of England, which will be given at the end of the Lost Tales. But in the earliest conception, he was not an Englishman of England. England, in the sense of the land of the English, did not yet exist, for the cardinal fact, made quite explicit in extant notes, of this... of, of of this conception is that the elvish isle to which Ariel came was England. That is to say, Tol Erisea would become England, the land of the English, at the end of the story. So notice here, when we're talking about a mythology for England, what he's doing, the initial conception here with Ariel, goes beyond, I'm going to tell a series of fairy stories which I'm going to root to England in some way. It goes beyond that. This initial conception of the mythology for England is not only a mythology for England, but a mythology of England, right? That is to say, a mythological history of the island of, you know, the British Isles themselves, right? And uh, the, the legends of how England came to be and the roots that England has, both the land and, in a sense, perhaps, the nation, um, the, the, the roots that it has in fairy itself. So again, we're not just having an encounter by an English person with the elves and him bringing those legends back uh, to the English and the way in which you know, the, those are sort of connected. No, in this initial conception, it is rather a mythological explanation of England itself. Koromas, or Cortirion, the town in the center of Tol Erisea, to which Ariel comes in the Cottage of Lost Play, would become in after days Warwick, and the elements Kor and War were, etymog were etymologically connected. Alalamanore, the land of elves, would be Warwickshire, and Tavrobel, where Ariel sojourned for a while in Tol Erisea, would afterwards be the Staffordshire village of Great Haywood. So again, we have here a literal connection um, that England used to be in this sense, well, not fairy itself, literally, that was Valinor, right? Um, but used to be an island of, of, uh, of the elves. What we see, therefore, um, is the, the, the connection between, in this, again, in this initial conception that we're getting here in Book of Lost Tales, Volume 1, um, in this initial conception, England becomes um, fairy in decline. It becomes the land, the, 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 this, this, this special land, um, you know, Tal Arisea, the Lonely Isle, um, the special land of the elves, which then declines away from them. Um, this is another passage here. Both here and in the Cottage of Lost Play, there are allusions to events still in the future when Ariel came to Tal Arisea. And though the full exposition and discussion of them must wait until the end of the tales, it needs to be explained here that the faring forth was a great expedition made from Tol Arisea for the rescue of the elves who were still wandering in the great lands. That is, again, in this system, it, that would be the equivalent of mainland Europe, essentially, right? Um, if Tol Arisea is going to become England. Um, Okay, right. Uh, C.F. Lindo's words, until such time as they fare forth to find the lost families of the kindred. At that time, Tall Arisea was uprooted, 
by the aid of Olmo, from the sea bottom and dragged near to the western shores of the great lands. So you see, Tolerasea used to be further away. It wasn't just across the British Channel. The reason now that, that uh, the British Isles are so close to the mainland is that they're actually uprooted and dragged there um, by Olmo. Right? Again, so that's, this is the mythological conception that we're getting here of England and how England is connected to ferry into these stories that we're getting in the Lost Tales. In the battle that followed, the elves were defeated and fled in, into hiding in Tol Arisea. Men entered the isle and the fading of the elves began. The subsequent history of Tol Arisea is the history of England, and Warwick is disfigured Cortirium, itself a memory of ancient Cor. The later Tyrion upon Tuna, city of the elves in Amman, in the Lost Tales, the name Cor is used both of the city and the hill. Um, okay, so you see how essential this connection between England and fairy, between England and the elves, um, is in this initial conception that Tolkien has. And again, I think that it's it's this this element is easy to overlook because even in the Lost Tales itself, um, the conception doesn't stick even from one end of the Lost Tales to the, to, the, to the next, much less beyond it, into the versions of the Silmarillion material that Tolkien would go on to revise and rewrite over the rest of his life. This, this uh, concept of, I want to call it a literal connection between, uh, between England, but again, maybe it's, it's uh, perhaps the, 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 the better distinction, or the better way to, to characterize the distinction is in what I said before, that is the difference between writing a mythology for England and a mythology of England. Um, and really, you think about it, it's um, two different ways in which the word myth is used, right? One, the way in which we're accustomed to using the word myth, the way that, that Tolkien sort of trains us to use the word myth. Um, uh, that is to say, a a story which touches truth, which conveys truth. It's not an allegory. It's not just to be interpreted. Um, you know, that is, it's not just to be translated. Uh, you know, it's not merely a story that is using symbols. Um, but it's also a story which is which is designed to be applied. A story which really which really touches us deeply. Um, in that sense. He, he can write his stories, which would be a mythology for England, right? But the other sense of myth, and what people more often think of when you say myth, what people will tend to assume you're talking about if you just talk about myths and mythology, um, are mythological explanations. That is, that is, stories which purport to explain, to give a mythic explanation for how something came to be. Right? We, we perceive some phenomenon in our world um, and uh, we tell a you know we, we, we have a story which explains why this phenomenon occurs right um, Myth in that sense Tolkien relatively quickly in his writing career kind of got out of the business of writing myth in that second sense right but he does write myth in that sense early on in the cottage of lost uh, in the the cottage of lost play in the book of lost tales and I find that really fascinating um, even to the point where he explains um, and Christopher Tolkien alludes to this later how Ireland got separated from the rest of the British Isles um, I, I, you know that that you know, not just the positioning of the British Isles, but uh, you know, sort of some of the particular topography of the British Isles is explained explicitly um, within this story of you know the moving of the island and um, uh, Olmo uprooting it and all that kind of thing. Um, so um, uh, that's um, that is a, a, an element that again, if especially if we've kind of been trained by on fairy stories, been trained by Tolkien's later thinking about myth, um, we might overlook this other, in a sense, simpler concept of mythology of England uh, that we're getting here in the Book of Lost Tales, but I don't want to miss that, um, because I think that it's a really, um, it's a really crucial thing, and in particular, it, ha it shows us a lot um, about, it, it, I think it gives, it provides for us an important context, not just to show us what he's thinking about England at that time, but that it gives us an important context for understanding 
the elves and the relationship between elves and men, how he is conceptualizing fairies and their relationship with our world um, in his early works. Um, I want to uh, here turn, uh, and I'm, I'm trying, going to try to restrict myself to be brief on this. There's a lot that I could say about the poem Cortirian uh, among, uh, among the Trees. Uh, I um, really like that poem. Um, I'm really, I'm delighted that Christopher Tolkien gave us all three versions. Um, some of you, uh, you, those of you who took the Unfinished Tales class with me may remember that at times I was complaining a little bit about um, uh, how I would sometimes wish that Christopher Tolkien would just give us more text, right? How sometimes he goes, especially in Unfinished Tales, goes a little bit too far, in my, in my personal opinion, um, in just saying, here's the essential differences between these two texts, and I would just, and, I, and I'm sort of saying, please just give us both of them, and then I can read them, and we can make our own judgments about what we think is important, and I would just love to see the full text. Um, and I am all over delighted that with Cortirian Among the Trees, he has given us all three full texts of the poem. It's great. Um, but anyway, I will try to, um, um, I will try to, uh, to stay a little bit focused here. Um, look at how he characterizes. This is, this is the very beginning. Now, I, I'm, having said I love the three versions of the poem, I want to be focusing on the first version of the poem, that is the one which is contemporary, it's a little bit before the rest of the Book of Lost Tales, the one which really comes from the Book of Lost Tales period, not from his 1930s revision or his much later uh, 1960s revision, though we're going to touch on that a little bit as a point of contrast. But, um, uh, but I, I want to stick with the early one primarily, because again, that's the one that I think really embodies, um, uh, really embodies the conception of, uh, of uh, elves and fairies that, uh, um, and their relationship with men that we're seeing that, that lies behind this world of the Book of Lost Tales and the Cottage of Lost Play. O fading town upon a little hill, old memory is waning in thine ancient gates, the robe gone gray, thine old heart almost still, the castle only, frowning, ever waits, and ponders how among the towering elms the gliding water leaves these inland realms, and slips between long meadows to the western sea. And still bearing downward over murmurous falls, one year and then another to the sea, and slowly thither have a many gone. Um, we have a the initial image of this poem, right? This is a poem about fading. Not quite from word one, from word two, if you count O as word one, right? Uh, if you don't count O, the exclamatory O, then fading is literally the first word of this poem. Um, o fading town upon a little hill. Old memory is waning in thine ancient gates. I love the ambiguity of that image, the waning of old memory. Whose memory is fading? Is it, is it the, is it uh, the modern residents of the town and their memory of the ancient days of that town? Is it in some uh, more, uh, more sort of nebulous or spiritual sense, the memory of the residents of the, mo of the modern city, of the, the ancient tree and the old traditions of the town? Is it the memory of the elves themselves, that memory is waning in thine ancient gates because the elves are leaving it and so those who remember are barely there? Is this even a sense in which the town or the hill or the gates themselves are remembering? I'm thinking of course of, um, of those passages in The Lord of the Rings um, where Legolas uh, speaks of the stones remembering, uh, the stones of Holland remembering the Noldor who built them. Um, you know, are we getting that kind of, a, of, a, of an image there? The way, you know, sort of the, the lack of specificity of the memory that is waiting there, I find really, uh, really fascinating. The heart of the town, again, I, 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 I think is what we're seeing there, that the, the heart of the, of the town is almost still. It is dying. It is dying of old age. Right, um, uh, its heart is almost still. The castle only, frowning, ever waits and ponders. 
waiting and pondering, uh, which seem to be associated with fading uh, in this poem. And of course, that we get the image of the river, right, bearing downward over murmurous falls, one year and, and yet another, and then another to the sea. Um, the, the years being carried out to sea, and of course, never returning from the sea. Um, and then that reference at the end, we don't even know what this poem is about. We wouldn't know until line 11 that fairies were involved in this at all, right? This could just be about any old town. And then it sort of sprung upon us in line 11, since first the fairies built Corterion. Um, that this ain't, these ancient gates, uh, you know, the, 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 old, the, the old heart of this town is, uh, is a product of the fairies, but we see their memory um, the remnants of their work is um, is fading and is slowly dying and being borne out like the years to the sea. Uh, notice the 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 rhythm and the rhyme of these of this stanza. This is a stanza. It's not just a bunch of lines and then he breaks because he's finished with his thought. Um, this is an eleven line stanza, and we see this eleven line stanza with this peculiar rhyme scheme that it has repeated at other places in the poem. That is to say, this is not a random grouping of lines. Um, this is this is a stanza structure by Tolkien in this poem, which I find fascinating. Look at the way that it works. Hill gates still waits. Okay, so it starts off with a, a pretty standard quatrain, four-line group, right? A, B, A, B. All right, so what are we expecting next? C, D, C, D, probably, right? And another pairing of rhymes and another quatrain to follow that. Elms, realms, C, falls. Wait a second. That didn't work at all, right? Instead of a quatrain, we got a couplet, and then two lines which don't rhyme at all. But wait a second, we get C again in line nine. So elms, realms, C, falls, C, gone, Corterion. So we have A, B, A, B, a quatrain, then C, C, right, two, a, a couplet, then another rhyme. So it's, it's, it's almost, if it were ten lines, it's almost a, a, an interesting structure, right, a, a sort of a simple structure, A, B, A, B, C, C, D, D, E, E, right, three couplets in a row, Elms, Realms, C, C, Gone, Corterion, except there's an extra line, still bearing downward over murmurous falls. Um, and how that ends up working is, I mean, there's an extra line in there, right, it's an 11 line stanza. Um, it's, uh, it's got this one extra line, r r line which doesn't rhyme with anything, right? And it's the murmurous falls. I think it's, it's very interesting. I, the, the fact that it's the word falls, I think, is kind of cool. Um, and it's the falls that comes in between the sea, right? Between the long meadows to the western sea, one year and then another to the sea. And it's the murmurous falls that are going, you know, so we've got the falls bracketed by the sea. It's really cool. Um, this stanza form is really interesting. Notice the, the it, you could probably tell when I was reading it, the line lengths are very irregular too. Um, this is not a very sort of standard, uh, um, Tolkien loved to vary the rhythm of his lines, vary them in the sense of varying, not usually varying the rhythm, more commonly varying the length of the lines. Um, but this is a, it, it's, it, this is challenging to map the lengths of these lines. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't work quite well. Um, it's like my reading, the way in which it seems to me to connect with the content of this poem is that it's like a decaying structure. It's not a perfect structure. It's not neat. It's tumbling down, um, this stanza is. Um, and I think it's, uh, I think it's really fascinating the way that he builds this. If you look, he stays consistent with this structure. Um, there are some variations that he gives to it um, in the later versions, but he stays consistent with this 11-line stanza structure um, in, uh, in, in subsequent versions. 
But anyway, more about the elves, more about the fairies. Thou art the inmost province of the fading isle, where linger yet the lonely companies. Still undespairing, they do, do they sometimes slowly file along thy paths with plaintive harmonies, the holy fairies and immortal elves, that dance among the trees and sing themselves a wistful song of things that were and could be yet. They pass and vanish in a sudden breeze, a wave of bowing, of bowing grass, and we forget their tender voices like wind-shaken bells, of flowers their gleaming hair like golden asphodels. Okay, notice the uh, stanza structure here. Again, same thing, same 11 line stanza, same rhyme, rhyme scheme. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the sudden breeze is the extra unrhymed line here in this one. Um, anyway, so see again, again, this is not just a random grouping. And there's, there's, it's, it's, it is the definite stanza structure that he has, con that he has constructed for this poem. I think that Tolkien doesn't get near enough credit for his imaginativeness and flexibility. Uh, as a versifier, just as somebody who is um, his creativity with poetic lines, with ryth with rhythmic structures, and with rhyme schemes, um, he is really adventurous. It doesn't. I don't think it always works really well, um, and sometimes I think his lines kind of suffer for it. Um, and I think it's I, perhaps it's one of you know he doesn't. Tolkien doesn't have a high reputation as a poet, um, which I think is a shame. Um, but in some ways, I think that his reputation as a poet sort of suffers as a consequence of his, both his adventurousness and his willingness to, um, to sort of subordinate the form of the poem to the content of the poem. Um, he is... Uh, yeah, he doesn't try to take the ideas that he has and squeeze them into a particular verse form. Um, he seems to allow the verse form to reflect the ideas that he's said, and sometimes that means they're really awkward, they're supposed to be really awkward. Anyway, um, I'm kind of rambling now about Tolkien's poetry, but I think it's really interesting. Um, uh, Look at the characterization here. I'm going to try to get away from uh, from uh, his prosody here and get back to his uh, his imagery about the fairies. Notice how he describes the elves here. How he is characterizing the fading elves of Cortirion, that is post Tall Erisaia Cortirion, post Dominion of Men on the island of of England. Um, uh, uh, elves and fairies here. Um, we have the fading isle again. I mean, we have that that repetition of fading. Um, the companies of fairies are are lonely, right? G giving us the sense of them being them being isolated, right? Them being cut off from other elves, from other fairies. Um, you know, there's this sense that they are they're lingering. Um, they were here from of old, but they are now lonely, right? They've now they're they're, they're now very few of them. Um, they are undespairing, though their harmonies are plaintive harmonies, right? They're undespairing, but it's not like they're triumphant, right? Um, uh, they're singing f wistful songs to themselves, like their plaintive harmonies. And they're singing songs of things that were and could be, yet they don't just sing about the past, they also think about the future. They, they also sing about the future, um, wistful songs not only about the past, but about the future, which I think is interesting. Um, they pass and vanish in a sudden breeze, a wave of, bow of bowing grass, and we forget their tender voices like wind-shaken bells. Um, the transitory nature of their impact on human hearers is one thing that's really interesting. Again, it seems to me the way in which this whole way of this whole experience, this whole way of thinking of things is passing away with them, that humans aren't really capable of living in the fairy world, of seeing the world um, through fairy eyes. 
they can experience, they can get glimpses of it, humans can, right? They can hear the song and be moved by it, but it leaves them very quickly. Um, and I think, I think that that's... Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Um, yeah, yeah. Where linger... So, you know, uh, Tom, I think I'm agreeing with you. Um, I do also take yet to mean still there in line uh, in line 44, where linger yet. Um, yeah, the Lonely Company is still linger there in the Fading Isle. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, yeah, Sarah King is wondering what they're singing of that could be yet. We don't know. Right, and again, I find that reference really fascinating because this is a po this is a poem which, from the beginning, has been looking back at the past, or is in a sense about a place which is intrinsically looking back at the past. Right, we're not really this poem doesn't seem very interested in the beginning anyway about the future of Cortirion, right? But the fairies haven't forgotten about the future, and they are not simply obsessed with the past. You know, when you think about it, this is something that's easy to. Um, to even bring from later conceptions, I mean, you think about um, think about the elves in the Lord of the Rings. Rarely are they singing songs about the future, right? Rarely are they focused on things that could be. Um, they focus more often on the past and on holding on to and uh, preserving um, that which was. Again, not exclusively, but that still that that remains um, sort of the the, the keynote um, of their world. Um, yeah, good. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Just as. Uh, as I was saying that, Arthur had just typed, unlike the elves we know and love, these fairies and elves recognize the existence of the future. That's, that's, that's a little strong language there, Arthur. But, but yes, that's, uh, um, I, I, I do find that striking um, in this way. Um, yeah, Tom says these elves uh, look more actively forward to the faring forth and the rekindling of the magic sun. Um, yes, 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 they do. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, look at the. This is um, this is from the end of the of the poem. The again, the first version of the poem, the early version of the poem. I need not know the desert or red palaces where dwells the sun. The great seas or the magic isles, the pine woods piled on mountain terraces and calling faintly down the windy miles, touches my heart no distant bell that rings in populous cities of the earthly kings. Here do I find a haunting ever near content, set midmost of the land of withered elms, alal minore of the fairy realms. Here circling slowly in a sweet lament, linger the holy fairies and immortal elves, singing a song of faded longing to themselves. The closing lines of this, of this version of the poem I think are very striking. Here circling slowly in a sweet lament. There's, you know, you've got the fairies dancing in an elf ring, as they so often do uh, in traditional fairy stories, um, but this is not a joyful fairy dance, right? They are circling slowly. You know, there's this, I, this, this image of the fairies, the closed circle of the fairies, and they're singing a lament. They're singing, for, they're singing about the passing, about the fading of Cortirion, presumably, among other things. Um, but they're still lingering, right? Um, notice that they are not only immortal elves, but they're holy fairies. Um, and I don't, I'm always a little resistant to putting too much pressure on holy there. That is to say, I don't think we need necessarily give that an explicitly religious sense. Um, but there is still that sense, I, I think at the very least, holy, um, the, the, the concept of the fairies being holy suggests them being set apart, them being, um, uh, well, no, I'll stick with, set apart from mortal things. They, we can't just go and join 
their circle. Um, as uh, you know, if you've read uh, a lot of traditional fairy stories, you know what happens when a mortal blunders into a fairy circle. Um, at, at the very least, the fairies disappear suddenly. Um, and, you know, you don't just come in and, and join in. That very rarely happens. Um, Smith of Wooten Major um, is himself a very a very uh, 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 an unusual exception in that way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, they uh, and they're singing a song of faded longing to themselves. Their longing is itself faded, which is really so. Like, their own desire is fading over time, um, and they're singing it to themselves, they're not singing to us, right? If we overhear them, um, we might have, you know, here in Cortirion, he, the speaker of the poem, finds a haunting ever near content, right? It's not, it's not real contentment. The contentment is ever near, is you're almost, always almost content, but not quite content. Um, and that the, the nearness but not the realization of that contentment is haunting to him. Again, he's overhearing those elves, this, but they're not singing to him. They're singing to themselves. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, look at the difference in tone um, between this version and the 1960s version, when he came back and, and revised it, thinking about submitting um, Cortirian Among the Trees uh, to the Adventures of Tom Bombadil book of, his, of poetry um, that was released in the mid-60s. I would not find the burning domes and sands where reigns the sun, nor dare the deadly snows, nor seek in mountains dark the hidden lands of men long lost to whom no pathway goes. I heed no call of clamant bell that rings iron-tongued in the towers of earthly kings. Here on the stones and trees there lies a spell of unforgotten loss, of memory more blessed than mortal wealth. Here undefeated dwell the folk immortal under withered elms, alal minore once in ancient realms. What do you notice? What strikes you about the difference between those two final stanzas? Yeah, both Tom and Kay uh, say undefeated. Yeah, yeah, they are undefeated. They're not singing a song of faded longing, right? Um, and the spell that lies upon the play is not a haunting ever near content. There is a spell of unforgotten loss, right? It's still loss, right? There's still an absence. Um, but that memory, the memory of the loss itself, is still more blessed than mortal wealth. Better to remember that which is gone and can't come back again than to have all mortal wealth, right? Um, but it's less tenuous. It's less fleeting. That there's not that... Uh, there, there isn't that element of ever near content, nor is there sweet lament. Here undefeated dwell the folk immortal under withered elms. Um, uh, yeah, Yama says they might not be defeated, but they're still fighting the long defeat in a way. Yes, yes. Uh, Tom says it, it's uh, reminding him of, uh, of, of Ulysses, that is, of, of, uh, um, of Tennyson's Ulysses, uh, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Yeah, it does have more of that tone, doesn't it? I mean, the, the, the way that this stanza strikes me, you know, the 1960s version strikes me, there's a, there, there's a line in the sand in this stanza, isn't there, right? You've got modern worldly values over there, right? The clamant bell that I heed no call of clamant bell that rings iron tongued in the towers of earthly kings. There's a defiance there, right? I refuse 
the call of the clamant bell. The bell of the, you know, the, the ringing out from the cities of earthly kings is calling to me, and it's calling to me in an, in a in a very sinister, iron-tongued voice, right? And it is insisting, and it is demanding, but I deny it. I refuse it. Instead, I choose here on the stones and trees. There lies a spell of. I choose the unforgotten loss. Right? I choose the memory more blessed than mortal wealth. Keep your mortal wealth. I'm going to keep the blessed memory of the unforgotten loss. Right? Um, uh, yeah, defined against the tide of time, Richard Rowland says. Um, yeah, yeah. And now I don't think you know. Uh, uh, Kay, I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced that it's the elves themselves who are drawing this line. It's the human speaker drawing that line, right? He's siding with the elves. The elves are not necessarily defiant. His attitude towards them, his perspective of them, though, is very different. They are undefeated. Um, the elves in the early version are, even their longing is faded, right? Um, the elves have dwindled. The elves have diminished. The elves themselves are fading and even their own desire and memory is fading. Um, we don't get that, right? There is a stubborn, um, again, even the memory of that which is gone is stronger and more beautiful and more powerful than all of the worldly glory of the modern human secular, you know, uh, uh, um, non-marvelous uh, world, right? Um, but we don't get that. That element seems to me almost entirely absent from the uh, the 1917 or the 1915 version. Um, I'm getting my dates wrong. Anyway, the 19-teens version uh, of Cortirion. Um, uh, there, the emphasis is on the decline, right? And on the fading um, of the elves of their, of the, the place that they built, their city is almost dead. I mean, the heart is slowing. Right, um, and eventually the heart of the town is going to stop, as year after year is borne away to the sea and never returns. Um, um, sweet lament, right? Um, Nancy, wonderful. They're dwelling here rather than lingering, as they do. Um, here, undefeated, dwell the folk immortal. Right, the folk, the immortal folk, they cannot be dislodged. Nancy, right? Um, they're just lingering. Um, they they live here. Okay, um, yeah, 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 I agree. Um, now, again, I, I, I don't want to, I, I, I almost didn't do this passage because I don't want to get so distracted with, like, the 1960s version that we sort of lose sight of where, but I think the contrast really brings out, really emphasizes the quality of what we see uh, in the Book of Lost Tales era version of this poem, right? Um, and it's important for us to keep that in mind um, and combine it, I would say, with this idea of the mythology of England that we we're getting. Um, when he does the mythology of England, that is the characteristic of England. What, what is the relationship that England has with its fairy history, right, with its elven past? Um, and that, that relationship is all about sweet lament and faded longing. Right, um, and the elves themselves, some still linger, right, and you know the holy elves, you know the the holy fairies and immortal elves still linger, um, but uh, they are not folk immortal, capital F, capital I. They're the lonely companies, right, um, and even again, even their even their own longing um, is fading. Um, Caitlin DeMarco says, I see it uh, as the first poem from the Elven point of view, but the later one has human biases. Yeah, I, I mean, in a sense, I think the positions are similar. That is, the speakers of both poems are clearly... Um, the speaker of each of those two poems, the early and the late, is clearly a human who has a... you know, who is sympathetic um, to the... Um, you know the the sort of the fairy element there, um, but boy is he less militant in the first version than in the later version here. And you know that the militant tone that we're that or what I'm calling a militant tone here in this last stanza is not general throughout the whole poem. Um, I mean, you go back and you read the 1960s version of Cortirian, and you know it's not this. Um, you know, we don't get the clamant bell uh, and hear undefeated dwell um, all the way through that poem. 
by any stretch, but but I do think it speaks not necessarily, Caitlin, to a difference in point of view. At least that's not how I would describe it, but rather um, a very different kind of experience, um, a different kind of um, a different kind of relationship between the fairies and this fairy world and the speaker. Um, he's more distant from it. Again, he's not swearing allegiance to it uh, in the earlier version. Um, even he's he's sensitive to it, um, but part of being sensitive to it is recognizing its 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 transience. Um, yeah, even the notice even the last line um, here undefeated dwell the folk immortal under withered elms, alal minore once in ancient realms. Even that seems like defiance, doesn't it? The last line of the poem is to restate, here's its real name, right? In ancient realms, this was Alal Minore, right? You know, there's there's a kind of, you know, I'm going to call it by its true name, and that's where I'm going to end, right? Um, uh, and again, that, that, that kind of defiance, I think, um, is uh, to me very, uh, very, very indicative of that of that tone, but again, that tone that we don't see um, earlier on. Um, okay. Anyway, I want to. I I want to. There's so much more I could say about Cortirian among the trees. It's such a a, a long and beautiful poem, um, and we get it in three versions. So there's so much to talk about, but I can't. I don't. I don't want to take too much time on that. Um, uh, we have more chapters to discuss and 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 other poems to get to. Uh, but remember, keep in mind the stuff about the mythology for England and of England. Um, keep in mind this glimpse that we get here in Cortirian Among the Trees um, of the, 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 the sweet lament and the faded longing and the ever near content. Um, uh, th those elements, I think, are important for us to keep in mind as we go through uh, the Lost Tales. I think that that's it, it. Really does kind of capture something about his conception of the fairies of the elves um, in this period. Um, and now let's move forward and let's look at the music of the Ainur uh, and uh, and the Valar. So I want to start with the music of the Ainur. Let me let me um, focus for a second on sort of how I want to talk about this. Um, I want to discuss chapter two and three primarily on their own terms. That is to say, I you know we're gonna obviously make reference to the Silmarillion version, but I don't just want to do non-Silmarillion highlights. That is, I'm not just gonna go through and say, let's look at the bits in which it deviates from the published Silmarillion and think about the significance of those. That's a perfectly acceptable thing to do, but I don't want to do that. Um, and the reason I, I don't want to do it's and, and by the way, that's particularly tempting, I think, to do of the music of the Ainur, since it is so close to the published Ainu Indale. You can see so much of the Ainu Indale that we know from the published Silmarillion. You can see so much of it there, you know, in this first version of the story. Um, and, you know, such that it's really, it's really particularly tempting, I find, to focus in on those bits, um, which either are there and have been removed or changed uh, in the later versions, or places where he has not yet put something that we um, that we know from the later published version. Um, but I don't want to do that, and the reason I don't want to do that is I think that in in just going through and looking at um, those particular passages that are changed or that are new, um, it's easy to miss too much of the sort of the character of the story as a whole. Um, I think that we'll notice differences between this version and the published version. We'll notice differences if we if we try to take it on its own ground, we'll notice stuff that we would have missed if we were just hunting for those uh, kind of obvious differences. Um, so again, I don't want to I don't want to subordinate our discussion to the published Silmarillion, even though we certainly will be making plenty of references to it. So, first, um, we get the explanation. Um, yeah, actually, so let me pause here and address. Uh, Carolyn Morehouse has a great question. When I'm reading the Book of Lost Tales, do I need to put aside Tolkien's later writings in my mind so as not to be continuously comparing the Book of Lost Tales? Um, <sighs> 
Well, Carolyn, I mean, on the one hand, no. I mean, it's not like you have to forget that any, I mean, you can't forget. You know, you're going to be comparing whether you try not to or, or, or not. Um, I'm trying to explain why I think this is a really valuable thing to do. Because in order for us to see what's going on here, if, well, I mean, okay. I guess another way of thinking about this is sort of to ask ourselves, why read this book, The Book of Lost Tales? Why read it? Um, what's the point of reading The Book of Lost Tales? If our answer to that question why I read the Book of Lost Tales is simply so that I can understand the Silmarillion better, you know, the published Silmarillion. Um, if that's our answer, then it makes perfect sense to just be using it continuously as a kind of a touchstone for this published Silmarillion. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing to do. In fact, it's a fun thing to do. Um, I encourage people to do that. There's a there's 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 a lot that you can gain from that if you take uh, the Silmarillion Ina Lindale and you go back and you do what I was saying we're not going to do. That is just go through and highlight in the Book of Lost Tales passages that are different from the published Silmarillion and compare and contrast and think what kind of changes has Tolkien made? You know, how has the story moved from here to here? What do we see him moving towards? What is the sort of the pattern of the revisions that we see him making? And of course, we're skipping a bunch of steps. They're intermediate manuscripts between the you know, Book of Lost Tales and the published Silmarillion, of course. But, um, uh, but nevertheless, you know, you could still do that, you know, sort of looking at the beginning point and the end point. If we did that, there would there would certainly be things that we would appreciate in the Silmarillion version much more than we would do if we hadn't done that. So again, it's not saying it's not a fruitful thing to do, but the problem is you're not going to emerge from that with any real appreciation or understanding of the Book of Lost Tales version on its own. If instead of, you know, so if our answer, in other words, to the question, why read the Book of Lost Tales, is anything other than in order to enrich my understanding of the published Silmarillion, if we also say, might want to answer that question by saying, because I am interested in learning about the mythology as it was in Tolkien's mind at the beginning, I want to know not just what ways in which this is different from how it would be later on, but I want to try to immerse myself in the world of 19 teens Tolkien, right? I want to, I want to, I want to introduce myself to 25 year old J.R.R. Tolkien and begin to try to understand how these stories work, how this, um, you know, how how these characters work, how this world works. What is this mythology about? Um, what kind of a world? was he describing here? Um, and Carolyn, to some extent, to do this, we do have to set aside the rest of them. And especially, Carolyn, the most important thing is that we have to set aside conceptions that we have of these characters from later books. That is, when you read about Manwe, it's most dangerous with the characters that are most similar to the ones that we get in later stories, right? I mean, you get Manwe who has the same name and very many of the same attributes and a very similar position and so much that we see about Manwe is so familiar from the published Silmarillion, but the character of Manwe in the Book of Lost Tales, it's not, he's not the same guy. He's not the same character. And we'll miss that if when we read about Manwe in the Book of Lost Tales, the picture that's in our brain is the picture that we've built of Manway from the Silmarillion. We do have to try with the work to distance ourselves from that and say, okay, what does the Book of Lost Tales show us about Manway? What is the Book of Lost Tales Manway character? And kind of build that up. Once we do that, once we understand Book of Lost Tales Manway on his own terms, then we can compare him to Silmarillion Manway, right? And we can we can we can see some interesting things in both directions there. Um, but this is why I want to try to invest ourselves as much as we can in this world, setting aside, to some extent anyway, you can't do it completely, but setting aside the other stuff so that we can sort of see what is this world, what is, uh, what is, this, what is this whole concept like, and then um, we'll be in a better position to be able to compare and contrast because too, too often... Um, People tend to think of 
Tolkien's thought as this one monolithic thing, right? You know, uh, and this this is something this happens to me so often, and I know I've said this before on various other occasions. Um, when people ask me questions, you know, if I'm doing a Q&A session or something, and somebody will ask me a question, well, what did Tolkien think about this? And it's really hard to answer questions like that, because I want to say, well, when do you mean? Tolkien thought lots of things, that, and his ideas changed over time. Um, if you have a tendency to think of Tolkien's stories, Tolkien's world, and Tolkien's ideas as sort of monolithic in that way, sort of static, as if there was one single thing that we could call Tolkien's story, or Tolkien's world, or Tolkien's history, or um, Tolkien's mythology. If, uh, if you have that kind of idea um, of Tolkien's world, then reading the history of Middle-earth will cure you of that, um, and help you to see the really interesting and rich ways in which his ideas grew over time, and it's really fascinating. Um, um, and it's one of the reasons why I always end up qualifying, you know, my answers to questions of those kinds all over the place in ways which I suspect are, uh, um, which I suspect are um, uh, uh, frustrating sometimes to people who are asking me the questions. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, um, good. Uh, Katya says uh, this is why I couldn't appreciate the Lost Tales until I was willing to read it from this second perspective. Yes, that is to read it from on its own to 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 try to get into it on its own terms. I agree. Um, one of the if you take the, sort of the published Silmarillion as the standard, and you are paying attention really primarily to the differences between the two, which is very likely to mean. Whether you think about it this way or not, that is very likely to become in practice ways in which the story was improved, right? Ways in which this old version of the story is kind of funny and kind of clumsy, uh, and uh, you know he revised it and it got much better. Um, so, ways in which the published Silmarillion is superior to the earlier version is often, if we're not really vigilant, what we end up doing when we think in that first way that I was describing. Um, and you're right, Katya. If you think in that way. You, there's no way you can come out of that with uh, any real sort of appreciation or respect for the Book of Lost Tales, and I suspect it's one reason why the reading of the History of Middle Earth volumes is so often for people just sort of seen as as laborious, right? Um, even kind of low yield in this way. It's like okay, I I, it, I kind of appreciate some things about the published Silmarillion better now, but that was a lot of work for that, right? Whereas if you look at it the other way, if you try to immerse yourself in it, um, you get a new experience. This is a different Middle Earth that we're getting here. Um, you know, I used to, I had a hard time with the Silmarillion when I first tried to read it in high school because what I wanted was another Lord of the Rings. I wanted a sequel to the Lord of the Rings. I wanted more of what I loved in the Lord of the Rings and I didn't get it. Um, and I, you know, I didn't get through it don't think I got through the Valaquenta. Um, in that same way, um, or rather sort of inverted from that, uh, if we approach the history of Middle-earth in the correct way, exactly what we can get is more, right? Um, this is not just a slightly different version of the Silmarillion, this is another Silmarillion. But it's a different Silmarillion, right? Um, if you like investing yourself in the Silmarillion, if you find the Silmarillion rich and rewarding um, as an imaginative and sort of mythological exercise, well, guess what? You can do it all again. You can get that whole experience new. Um, uh, you know that that's um, that's I think the great reward of trying to invest in the Lost Tales um, uh, on their own. So, okay, um, yeah, yeah, um, okay, good, yeah, sorry, I, I, I'm trying to sift through some of the comments that people are making here, um, yeah, good, good, um, yeah, Kay, uh, Ben Abraham says, Christopher Tolkien walks that line well, he writes about not a progression from bad to good, but a development, neutral, the shape things took over time, chronicling like a, like a historian. Yeah, there are times when he 
when he does make evaluative judgments, where he does um, uh, express some sort of disapproval, and not disapproval, that's the wrong word, but you know, the, 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 there are times when he does suggest that the revisions made over time were an improvement. Um, but you're right, Kay, that he doesn't, um, he does invite us to sort of consider it on its own. Here is one stage of the thinking, right? And let's try to understand what the thinking was at, you know, what, what the story was at that time. Um, yeah, yeah. And Brianna, I agree. One of the rewards of it is that you will, you are very likely to find things in the Book of Lost Tales and in the history of Middle-earth that you do in fact like better than the published Silmarillion. Um, there are things which, you know, because it is certainly not something which is just, you know, a, uh, a, a steady progression from, you know, less competent to more competent or from, you know, from less moving to more moving. Um, it's a ch it's sometimes it's just a difference you know from oranges to apples and you might like oranges better than apples even even though apples are good um, you know you might like oranges so I think that that's um, uh, I, I think that that's something that uh, um, is definitely a, a, a reward of trying to read the Book of Lost Tales in this way. Um, Kay's asking for an example of something I like better than uh, like better in Lost Tales. We'll get to some. We'll get to some. In fact, there are, there are even some things uh, today that I find really fascinating. Um, um, one really simple thing, Kay. I, to me, one of the most striking things about the differences uh, between the Book of Lost Tales and the Silmarillion is how much less terse the Book of Lost Tales is. We get so much more so often. Um, one of the passages that I'm hoping <laughs> increasingly in vain to get to tonight is uh, his description of Tolkas. I love Tolkas. He's one of my favorite Valar. And, 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 and yet we get so little of him in the Silmarillion, you know, there's that there's that delightful crack about how he's of no avail as a counselor. Um, but other than that, we don't get. I I I always wanted more of Tolkas, and by golly, we get more of Tolkas in the Book of Lost Tales, and I like that. Um, anyway, so there there are some things like that, I think. Um, but but um, uh, okay, certainly there will be more examples that I will um, uh, that I will be mentioning as we uh, as we go along. Um, Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I agree, Yana, and several of you have been expressing this, that it's really very difficult to set aside what we know of the Silmarillion. And I'm not asking, I, 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 yes, it's impossible to forget. Um, all I ask is that you not, is, is that you try to avoid reading the Book of Lost Tales simply as a touchstone for the Silmarillion itself, but to try to get it in its own terms. You can still keep comparing just move the comparison down a step. First, look at the story and the characters in the passage, um, you know, the passages in the Book of Lost Tales. Then compare to the Silmarillion, not just sort of immediately leaping to the Silmarillion, um, if you see what I mean by that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Richard says we need to make ourselves small before we enter the cottage of lost play. Yeah, it's a it's it's a metaphor that really works, uh, doesn't isn't isn't it? Uh, I mean, I, I think that that really does work. Um, I like that very much. Okay, so let's let's do this. Let's stop talking about it and start getting into it, or I'm never going to get to even. Uh, I, I'm going to see if I can achieve the noble goal of getting through half of my slides tonight. Uh, okay, let's look at Iluvatar. Here is our first introduction. Here's Ariel's first introduction to Iluvatar. Yet, said Ariel, tell me, Rumo, I beg, some of what you know, even of the first beginnings, that I may begin to understand those things that are told me in this isle. But Rumo said, Iluvatar was the first beginning, and beyond that no wisdom of the Valar or of Eldar or of men can go. Who was Iluvatar? said Ariel. Was he of the gods? Nay, said Rumo, that he was not, for he made them. Iluvatar is the Lord for always, who dwells beyond the world, who made it, and is not of it, or in it, but loves it. This I have never heard elsewhere, said Ariel. 
That may be, said Rumo, for tis early days in the world of men as yet, nor is the music of the Ainur much spoken of. Okay. Let's start with some theology here. What do we learn about Iluvatar from this passage? We're told some fairly specific things, and I think it's important. This is Notice also that this passage being given to us within the frame provides us a context for the music of the Ainur that we do not get in the published Silmarillion, right? It's one of the striking things about the Aino Indole in the published Silmarillion that we just begin out of nowhere with, there was Eru, the one, right? Um, here we get a context for it. We get some explanation, some preemptive explanation of Iluvatar um, and explicitly theological context for Iluvatar. We are told many important things about how to conceptualize Iluvatar before we begin the story of the music of the Ainur. And I want to make sure that we're sort of all on the same page about this. What are we, what are we told? Tell me, some, tell me some, some facts about Iluvatar that we learn from this passage. Good, K. He is not an incarnational god. He made the world, but he is not of it or in it. Yes, God is a, the, he is a transcendent God, right? He transcends his creation. It, he created, he, 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 uh, let's back up, he created the world, right? He made it. Um, it is a product of his. He is not part of it. It is not him. He is not it. He is not, emphatically not, a pantheistic God, right? Um, he is not the universe he made. He is not the world. He made the world. Um, and he transcends it. Good. Brian, yes, he is not of the gods, but he made them. Right? Yes, good. So he is, we see him in a clearly defined hierarchical relationship with those who are called the gods. Chris points out he's not only outside the world, but he's outside of time uh, as well. Yes, there is that implication. He is the Lord for always who dwells beyond the world. Um, yes, now that's not stated quite as clearly. His being outside of time is not stated quite so clearly as some of the other things are, but that Lord for always does, uh, it, to me, is suggestive of that. Um, uh, good, good. Um, yeah, Kate points out that, you know, he's not of the gods, so he avoids calling Iluvatar God, though he is superior to the gods. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Richard, yes, uh, the... Richard Rowan is pointing to Tolkien's concept of sub-creation. Um, and yeah, Richard, what I would say here, we do see not Iluvatar, of course, acting as sub-creator, right? Iluvatar is just acting as creator, right? But the way in which the creativity of Iluvatar and the creative acts of Iluvatar um, are parallel to the smaller scale um, acts of sub-creation by some creators, I think we, we definitely do see that um, see that established here. Um, Yana says, I find it strange that Ariel's usage of the word gods is not corrected, and in fact gods is used throughout. Absolutely, yes. It's one of the characteristic pieces of vocabulary of the, uh, of the Book of Lost Tales period. Um, just as we see the elves being uh, persistently referred to as fairies, those two words being used completely interchangeably um, in, uh, uh, you know, throughout, throughout this story in ways which declined over the years. He ceases to use fairy um, as a synonym for elves. You don't see the word fairy used that way in The Lord of the Rings. Um, so too, he used to, he, he in the Book of Lost Tales period used the word gods to describe the Valar. Um, they, are, they are the gods. And no, he's not corrected because he's perfectly right. That's the vocabulary that is used in the Book of Lost Tales period. Um, uh, so I think that that is an important thing to uh, uh, to sort of address. Um, does was the first beginning apply that he is not eternal, that he had a beginning? I don't think so, Alex. In fact, it seems to me to suggest the contrary. In fact, that's that seems to me to suggest what, uh, to support what Chris Stevens was talking about of his being outside of time. He is the first beginning. Not that he has a first beginning, but he was the, when, when anything began, when, when, you know, anything that you point to as the beginning, Iluvatar was it, right? So that he, pre-exists everything. He is the one thing 
which is eternal. The elves are not eternal. They're immortal, but they're not eternal. The gods are not eternal because Iluvatar is the beginning of them. He made them as well. And the world is certainly not eternal because Iluvatar is making it as well. Um, yes, uh, Kay, I agree with you. He is more like the Aristotelian god, the unmade maker. Yes, that element does certainly seem to be present. And Brian Yoder, thank you. You're right. He is a loving, probably benevolent god. Yes, it's not only that he made it and is not of it or in it, but he loves it. The love of Iluvatar for his creation is something which is not only um, stated, but put in that prominent place. That's the, that's the end, right, of Rumil's little description of who Iluvatar is. His last note is that he loves the world. Um, and that, I think, is, uh, um, is an important thing. Um, Yes, yes, good. It's good. So several of you are pointing that Brandon and Carolyn and uh, Timothy. Um, very good, very good. Um, he does seem to be benevolent in that way. Um, yeah, Carolyn points out his being a transcendent being, but um, but capable of love. Yes, absolutely. Um, that is a very important, a very important thing. Um, Timothy's asking about that last sentence. Um, that how how saying that the last sentence is kind of cryptic. Is Rumel speaking of the present? Um, that it is not yet um, the world of that that you know. It is early days in the world of men as yet. That's in Ariel's time, which is before the beginning of English history. Um, men in the post-Christian era are not going to be able to say, what? There is a monotheistic, transcendent God who created and loves the world? I've never heard of such a thing. Um, they would certainly not be able to say that. Ariel can say that, because that is not that does not compute in the worldview that he has always had. Um, uh, so in this sense, that, that, that what I... I don't want to lean on this too heavily yet. Um, we'll come back to this later. But one of the things that I see in that line by Rumel there at the end is this: is the way in which Iluvatar is described. The, the description of creation and of Iluvatar himself is being made by Rumel there explicitly pre. I want to be careful. I was going to say pre-Christian, but that's a confusing term. Um, I want to be careful there. Sometimes I use the word pre-Christian to simply mean within the chronological period of time that predates Christianity, and I want to preserve that term for that usage. Um, Proto-Christian, maybe, um, is the term I'm looking for. That is to say that Rumel is anticipating the coming, uh, that at some point in the world of men, men will know about the truth about the transcendent, benevolent creator God. They don't yet, um, but they will at some point in the future, that there is a sort of a latent anticipation of future Christianity that we can see, I believe, at some moments. And this is much more pronounced, I believe, in the Lost Tales than it is in, in the later versions of Tolkien's mythology. Um, <laughs> Kate suggests preparatory Christian or incipient Christian. Uh, I kind of like uh, incipiently Christian. Uh, let's go with that, Kate. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I like that. That there is, I, I, I do believe he is referring to, to, to sort of incipient Christianity there. That's my understanding anyway of that line. Okay, but now let's go on to Iluvatar's actual story. Upon a time, Iluvatar propounded a mighty design of his heart to the Ainur, unfolding a history whose vastness and majesty had never been equaled by aught that he had related before, and the glory of its beginning and the splendor of its end amazed the Ainur, so that they bowed before Iluvatar and were speechless. Then said Iluvatar, the story I have... Well, let's pause here for a second. I'm going to break this down into two parts. Uh, in that first bit, the thing that I find most striking about this is the fact that when he is propounding, when Iluvatar is propounding his theme, note that in this version of the story, he is explicitly 
recru no, recruiting, probably not the right verb. Um, he is, uh, he is, well, I'll still use it. He is explicitly recruiting the Ainur to work with him in the creation of a history, in the telling of a story, right? Um, that is, he, he's, he, he's unfolding to them a story. A his, it's a history, not just a theme. It's a history that he's unfolding to them. And it's that history which is splendid and glorious and has never been equaled by any other story before. Um, so it's not just the making of a music. It's the telling of a story. Now, music is the medium of that story, right? But it is still explicitly a story that he's telling and that they are perceiving and responding to and that he is involving them in, as he's going to explain their involvement a little bit more here. Then said Aluvatar, the story that I have laid before you and that great region of beauty that I have described unto you as the place where all that history might be unfolded and enacted. So we have not only the story, we have the place, right? So he's, he has unfolded to them about creation. Here's this world that I want to create, in this great region of beauty. And it's going to be the place where that history. I've also so I, I, I'm, I, I've revealed to you the world, the create the world that I'm creating. I've also revealed to you the story of that world in time, right? Um, okay. All that is related only as it were in outline. I have not filled all the empty spaces, neither have I recounted to you all the adornments and things of loveliness and delicacy whereof my mind is full. It is my desire now that ye make a great and glorious music and a singing of this theme, and, seeing that I have taught you much and set brightly the secret fire within you, that ye exercise your minds and powers in adorning the theme to your own thoughts and devising. But I will sit and hearken and be glad that through you I have made much beauty come to song. Okay, what do you, what do you note here? What strikes you about this passage? Well, I'll start with one. The, not only is the fact that this is a history, the fact that this is a story that's being told, foregrounded, strongly foregrounded in this version of the story as well, is the fact that he is leaving them f free uh, to adorn this. The adornment is referred to in the published Silmarillion, right? The fact that they're going to adorn it. Um, but that business about the outline, I've given you, an, he, he explains a little bit more about how it works, about the, the scope and the degree of the freedom um, of the Ainur here, they're given the outline. Here's the outline of the story. But it's just, an, there's all these empty spaces in that outline. Um, I'm not laying out for you the adornments and the things of loveliness and delicacy whereof my mind is full. It's like to think of it in musical terms, and people who know more about music than I do might be able to make a less clumsy metaphor. It's like the difference between a, you know, being given a set of sheet music with all the, you know, and play all of these notes, you know, grouped together in exactly these ways, because other people are going to be playing other notes, and that's going to make a lovely symphony, a lovely symphony, and giving someone a set of chord progressions. Here's the chord progressions that I want you to do. Now, play music following these chord progressions. Um, there's a lot of scope for them to invent. There's a lot of scope for them to sub-create. Um, but there is a framework that they, you know, they're not just improv completely on their own. Um, okay. Uh, Good, Richard. I'm glad that you pointed that out, uh, Richard. Roll. I agree with you that one of the elements that I find very, um, very prominent in this passage is the paradox. The paradox of God's plan of Iluvatar's intent. Uh, you know, uh, the history that Iluvatar has worked out 
and the freedom of the will of the Ainur, the freedom of, of, of choice and, and uh, um, you know, invention of the Ainur. The paradox between those things is front and center, I think, in this. Notice, I have n neither have I recounted to you all the adornments and things of loveliness and delicacy. He doesn't say, I haven't recounted to you all the adornments and things of loveliness and delicacy that you might think up, because, you know, you can think up, I don't know what you're going to think up. You can think up whatever you want, right? No, no, no. I haven't recounted to you all these adornments whereof my mind is full. My mind is full of adornments and loveliness and delicacy, right? But I haven't told them to you. I want you to do them. But there's the implication of when they improvise, right? When they, within the scope, improvise, you know, when, when they do their own invention, the things that they invent are going to be the things whereof Iluvatar's mind is full, right? The, they are going to be bringing forth the things that are in Iluvatar's mind. Um, and... Uh, uh, Yes, yeah, so Gerald asks. So it's kind of like jazz. Uh, yes, that's anyway. That's certainly my. It's the 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 improvisational element of the music of the Ainur, which is prominent from the beginning to the end. Uh, you know, of the development of the of the music of the Ainur story in Tolkien's uh, in Tolkien's uh, career. Um, that yeah, I always think of the music of the Ainur as jazz, essentially. Um, Don asks, is he giving up his authority to control events? He leaves, seems to be leaving up so much to the Ainur. Yes, except everything that they have comes from him. Um, notice again, continuing on, uh, the loveliness and delicacy whereof my mind is full. It is my desire now that ye make a great and glorious music um, and a singing of this theme and that you exercise your minds and powers in adorning the theme to your own thoughts and devising. Great. Why should they exercise their own minds? Seeing that I have taught you much and set brightly the secret fire within you. Because you have much from me and because I have placed the secret fire within you, therefore they are empowered to exercise their minds and powers in adorning the theme to their own thoughts and devising because their own thoughts and devising are derived from his thoughts. He has placed, he has put his thought within them. That doesn't mean that he's, it doesn't make their thoughts less free, but they're not bringing forth things that don't come from him. Um, again, I think we can see in these passages Tolkien not compromising on the two sides of things. That is, the history as it's going to unfold is the history that he wants told. He has this history in mind and says, this is what's going to happen. I'm revealing to you what creation is going to be like, but you're going to be the ones that do it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, He does. Um, let's see. Gerald Michael says, Iluvatar puts great faith and trust in the Ainur. Yes, yes, he does. But what are the chances that this is going to get totally out of control? On the one hand, yes, he's putting trust in them. He's leaving a lot up to them. Are they going to blow it? What are the odds that they blow it? Right? Is he is he taking a gamble, Iluvatar? Is he risking that the world is not going to turn out like he wanted it to turn out because they're going to screw it up? Well, in fact, they try to screw it up. And he tells them, oh, you didn't screw it up. Um... We'll get to that in a second. Um, let's move on to the rebellion. 
In this way, the mischief of Melko spread, darkening the music, for those thoughts of his came from the outer blackness, whither Iluvatar had not yet turned the light of his face. And because his secret thoughts had no kinship with the beauty of Iluvatar's design, its harmonies were broken and destroyed. Yet sat Iluvatar and hearkened till the music reached a depth of gloom and ugliness unimaginable. Then did he smile sadly and raised his left hand, and immediately, though none clearly knew how, a new theme began among the clash, like and yet unlike the first, and it gathered power and sweetness. But the discord and noise that Melkor, that Melko, excuse me, had aroused, start, I sometimes will misspeak myself with these things, had aroused, started into uproar against it, and there was a war of sounds, and a clangor arose in which little could be distinguished. Then Iluvatar raised his right hand, and he no longer smiled, but wept. And behold, a third theme, and it was in no way like the others. So, a third theme, and it was in no way like the others, grew amid the turmoil, till at the last it seemed that there were two musics, progressing at one time about the feet of Iluvatar, and, the, and these were utterly at variance. One was very great and deep and beautiful, but it was mingled with an unquenchable sorrow, while the other was now grown to unity and a system of its own, but was loud and vain and arrogant, braying triumphantly against the other as it thought to drown it, yet ever as it essayed to clash most fearsomely, finding itself but in some manner supplementing or harmonizing with its rival. Now, Kate has pointed out, Kate Neville has pointed out very accurately in reference to my comment about what if they blow it? Like, is he rolling the dice? Is he is he gambling here? Kate says, no, he knows they're going to blow it. It's not like the rebellion of Melkor is going to be like, oh my gosh, Melkor rebelled. I never saw that coming. No, I don't think so. Um... Carolyn points out that Louvatar smiled sadly, as though he might have expected it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Caitlin, I agree. Um, I too think the fact that Louvatar wept in the third theme is very moving. Um, Kay, here's one of my first ones. I like that better than the published Silmarillion. The weeping of Louvatar, I like better. I think that's, uh, I, I find that very much, uh, very much more powerful um, than his lack of tears uh, in the published Silmarillion version. Um, anyway, um, notice Iluvatar does explicitly take a hand in the music himself. That is, he does not leave, in fact, everything to the Valar. The theme that arises, um, Tolkien emphasizes, that when he raises his left hand in the first paragraph there, immediately, though none clearly knew how, a new theme began among the clash. Iluvatar is bringing forth music, which it seems that no, none of the Ainur are actually producing, right? Um, so we do have a music which seems to be coming directly from Iluvatar himself. So he has not, in fact, left 100% of the working out of this story that he has planned to them. And again, if we do conclude a conclusion which I don't consider inevitable from that first Iluvatar passage we were looking at. I don't think it is inevitable to look at Rumil's description of Iluvatar and conclude that he's outside of time. Um, that seems to me very likely, based on what is described about him being the first beginning and about him being the Lord for always. Um, both of those two things do suggest to me an eternal God who is outside of time. Um, but it's not as inescapable as the fact that he's a monotheistic god and a transcendent god and a benevolent god. Those things are stated much more emphatically in that passage. But still, I am, 
I'm willing to to put my chips on uh, uh, you know a an an eternal. I was about to make up a word, but I don't need to make up a word. An eternal God, um, uh, and therefore, again, he's leaving everything up to them, to the to the Ainur, to embellish and to to develop. Um, but he's going to make the story come out as he wants it to be. But again, it's not just a matter of, if you guys screw it up, I'm going to intervene and fix it. And because I'm a really good fixer, I can make it so that it still comes out to be pretty good. Um, you, you know, like uh, like you being a kid trying to cook dinner, and you're about to set dinner on fire, and your parent comes running in and, you know, saves dinner. <laughs> you know, that's that's not like the kind of intervention that we're getting from Iluvatar here, I think, especially since, again, their own thoughts and imaginings, which they are using, are themselves derivative of him and of his gift to them of the secret fire. Um, so it's much more, it's much more um, intimate than that. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> James says Luvatar is going to come in and retcon creation. Exactly, James. See, it's exactly like Tolkien's subcreation. We see the see the creation and subcreation echoes going in. Precisely, precisely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Kate says once Luvatar started communicating with the Valar, there would have to be some sort of time, not measured since there was no light yet, but spaces between beings. Yeah, when you have these, the Valar do clearly operate within time and within space, right? Um, they are related to each other in particular ways and within time. So yes, the Valar do seem to be operating within time. Uh, again, you know, he is the first beginning, right? He comes before, before the world, before the Valar, I think, before time, Um Come, so yes, he's already started time in motion. So you see, Kate, the implication of that? His unfolding the story to them is part of the story. In fact, it's the first story that we're getting in the Book of Lost Tales, right? Um, the story of the story, but the unfolding of the story is chapter one of the story itself. And yes, Susan, music as we know it implies time. Um, a couple other people were saying that before too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, there's already a sense in which in giving his uh, Mythgard students who are taking or have taken my Chaucer classes uh, will appreciate how much I am forbearing talking about Boethius here because uh, <laughs> I'm really tempted but anyway but I'm not I'm not gonna go there um, I the difference between the unified concept you know God being outside of time his plan for creation is unified um, he is in a sense translating when he is giving to them when he's outlining for them this history translating his vision his conception into um, into within time. The music itself is a representation of that. Um, Carol and I agree that unquenchable sorrow is another beautiful Tolkien phrase like unnumbered tears. I definitely agree with that. One other thing that I would point out here um, in before we segue to our next passage, um, which we're going to get to dog on it today, uh, before I'm going to probably wave the white flag. But um, uh, look at the what is said about Melko and what motivates Melko. This I find very interesting. Um, Melko's thoughts come from the outer blackness whither Iluvatar had not yet turned the light of his face. And because his secret thoughts had no kinship with the beauty of Iluvatar's design, its harmonies were broken and destroyed. This makes it sound as if Melko's thoughts are alien to Iluvatar. And that's interesting. Um, I have said before, you might have heard me say before, that in the published Ainu Lindelay, 
in particular in the published Dine of the Millet. Uh, and I think in other places, uh, I believe Tolkien to be most of the time, um, I think he's rarely inconsistent with this, um, I believe Tolkien to be an Augustinian as far as the nature of evil is concerned, which means simply following St. Augustine's uh, teaching about evil, that evil is not itself a positive thing, it is only a negative thing, that evil is by definition the twisting or perversion of a positive thing. There's no such thing as a positive evil. Only Evil is only negative, it's only the absence. It is never a positive thing. Um, just as you cannot shine darkness in the light, but you can shine light in the darkness because light is a positive thing that has being. Darkness is a negative thing. It does not have being. It is the mere absence of light. So too, evil uh, is the mere absence of good or the twisting or perversion of good. But good is the only positive thing. Evil is, in that sense, a negative thing, like darkness is a negative thing. That's the Augustinian doctrine about evil. And I have said on many, several other occasions before um, that um, Tolkien's description, his depiction of evil, um, seems to me to be very a, a very thoroughgoing Augustinian conception. Um, you know, think of Elrond saying, um, you know, nothing is evil in the beginning. Even Sauron was not so. Very Augustinian that idea. Um, all evil creatures are creatures that are either have been twisted and perverted or who have themselves fallen through their own sin, through their own choice. But, having said that, if instead of the published Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings, I were basing my analysis of Tolkien's depiction of evil only from the music of the Ainur in the Book of Lost Tales, if the Book of Lost Tales were in fact the only published work by Tolkien, I would be much less confident in that, because that this sounds like a non-Augustinian concept of evil. The idea that his thoughts come from the outer blackness, as if the outer blackness is itself a thing. Now, it's still called the voids earlier on. That concept of the void is still present, um, but and even think of the emphasis on the glooms and the ugliness, right? That the music um, has a quality which is ugliness and gloom. There's even in there this sort of sense of evil as a more more of a positive thing. Um, evil as something which sort of exists on its own. Um, again, there's at least the sort of hint of it um, uh, in, uh, in this much more so than we see in other places. It's one thing that I find really interesting about this. But let's get on to the problem of evil. Uh, and I'll let you go after we talk about the problem of evil. Um, okay. Thou, Melko, shalt see that no theme can be played save it come in the end of Iluvatar's self, nor can any alter the music in Iluvatar's despite. He that attempts this shall find himself in the end, but aiding me in devising a thing of still greater grandeur and more complex wonder. Okay, um, just pause on that for a second. Notice the strength of this. That is, it's, it's not just saying, um, no theme can be played except it's kind of under my rule, or no theme can be played except in the end I can use it for my purposes, right? He's much stronger than that. No theme can be played save it come in the end of Iluvatar's self, that he is the origin of all things, and none can alter the music in Iluvatar's despite. How risky was that move of, uh, you know, giving so much scope to the to the Ainur to, to do their thing? Um, not... In fact, it turns out, in the end, very risky, because none can alter the music in Iluvatar's despite. At the end of the day, the music played is the music that Iluvatar wanted. The story is not going to be fundamentally altered. It's, it's still going to come out as he wants it to come out. But that doesn't change the fact that the choices that the Ainur make in adorning the theme are their own choices. This doesn't invalidate what was said before, but rather asserts the other side of the paradox. And this is good traditional Christian theology, that both sides of that paradox are true. 
that God's will is inescapable, that God has his providential plan for all of human history. He knows all things that shall be and has formed the story of the universe, and that story is the story that he wants it to be. And yet, the actions of human beings and of angelic beings are free, and that their choices really matter and are not constrained. Um, these two things are both held to be true. If it seems to you impossible that both of these things should be true at the same time, read Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, and Lady Philosophy will explain it all to you. Um, but, um, okay, for low, through, through, through Melko, have terror as fire and sorrow like dark waters, wrath like thunder, and evil as far from my light as the depths of the uttermost of the dark places come into the design that I laid before you. Through him has pain and misery been made in the clash of overwhelming musics, and with confusion of sound have cruelty and ravening and darkness Loathly mire and all putrescence of thought or thing, foul mists and violent flame, cold without mercy, been born, and death without hope. Yet is this through him, and not by him, and he shall see, and ye all likewise, and even shall those beings who must now dwell among his evil and endure through Melko misery and sorrow, terror and wickedness, declare in the end that it redoundeth only to my great glory, and doth but make the theme more worth the hearing, life more worth the living, and the world so much the more wonderful and marvelous that of all the deeds of Iluvatar it shall be called his mightiest and his loveliest. Again, doing a little bit of inescapable comparison with the published Silmarillion, I love the, how much more we get. Um, a lot, a, 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 a trend, it's not universal, but a very noticeable trend when we look at how he revises things later is condensation that they get. And I, you know, many people would say that that's better, but I like the expansion. I like seeing more. I like hearing him dig into that a little bit more. Um, okay. Um, what do we see here? Notice how he is combining two things very explicitly and very repeatedly. That is the extremity harshness, the, 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 the elemental chaos that has been introduced to the world, extreme heats and colds and, uh, uh, you know, and all these things um, have been introduced to the world by Melkor, but also moral evil is a consequence, excuse me, I called him Melkor again accidentally, Melko, um, have been introduced by Melko here, and that he uses the one as a metaphor for the other persistently all the way through, terror as fire, and sorrow like dark waters. Of course, both terror and fire have been introduced by Melko. Both sorrow and dark waters have been, and wrath and thunder, and all of these, so, you know, the, both the elemental stuff and the moral stuff have all been introduced. Um, we are going to get the physical things, loathly mire, and all putrescence, but putrescence of thought or thing, right? Moral putrescence as well as physical putrescence have come through Melko's discord, through Melko's rebellion and through the adornments that Melko has thought to put into the music. Um, what's the, the final analysis going to come from? Notice where, um, um, notice where, who is going to testify to the marvelous and the wonderfulness and the loveliness of this creation, those who endure it, right? Um, 
Mm, just such a long sentence. I'm tracing back here syntactically. Um, those beings who must now dwell, must now, this is now going to happen. Notice he doesn't take it back, right? When he grants to them, the, to, this, to the Ainur, the ability to adorn the history, to adorn the music with thoughts of their own imaginings, he doesn't rescind that after Melkor does, does his thing, right? Um, there's a must in there now. Those beings who must now dwell among his evil and endure through Melko, misery and sorrow, terror and wickedness, those beings shall declare in the end that it redoundeth only to my great glory. Those who endure this will proclaim that the theme is more worth the hearing, life more worth the living, and the world so much the more wonderful and marvelous. Um, that is what Iluvatar proclaims, and notice again the really strong statement that he makes. Um, but, hang on a second, Iluvatar, um, how would you let him do this? Didn't he alter the music in your despite? I mean, come on, you improv there, right? I mean, like, you might have recovered the thing, but he did alter it in your despite. You know, it's like the kid that you let cook dinner, and you gave the kid the recipe, but they didn't follow the recipe. Right? They put in wrong stuff. Maybe you came in and were a good enough cook that you could put in some other things to kind of balance out the weird stuff that the kids put in there so that the result is edible, right? But you can't pretend that it's what you... It, that's not what was the recipe, right? Uh, the, the actual dinner produced is not going to be like the recipe. So come on, he altered it in your despite, right? And Lubitar says, no, no. Yet this is through him and not by him. Melko is the instrument of this, not the origin of this. Um, uh, he that attempts to alter the music will find himself but aiding me in devising a thing of still greater grandeur and more complex wonder. Does this mean that Iluvatar wanted the evil? That evil was his plan all along? That Melko's job was to introduce evil? Right? That that uh, that this is that was precisely what Iluvatar planned. He wanted all of this evil and suffering in the world, so that you know it could, in the end, contribute to this um, to this great beauty, uh, you know, to all of this uh, mightiness and loveliness that we're going to get at the end. There, no, no, um, he doesn't say that. He doesn't. This is not Iluvatar embracing that evil, but rather saying that in doing this, in attempting. He recognizes that Melko has attempted to alter the music in Iluvatar's despite, but in attempting that, um, he is only aiding Iluvatar in devising a thing of still greater grandeur. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, in the end, Okay, okay, I can't. I was going to try to continue to carry on my uh, my uh, kids cooking dinner uh, analogy, uh, but I'm not sure I can. I mean, you can say like in the end, the dish that's going to be made is going to be even better than the recipe, but that again, that's not exactly what Elutra is saying here. Uh, so I don't want to strain my analogy, um, but um, we can see here, you know, again, the, in this story, the very strong assertion of. Um, not only of Iluvatar's power and Iluvatar's control, but of, again, of both sides of it. I, th I find really striking, especially compared to the published Silmarillion, how striking is the emphasis on evil here, right? Um, it's not just about the elements. It's not just about extreme colds and extreme heats and things like that. Um, it's about putrescence. Um, putrescence, both of thought and thing. Um, and, and he emphasizes the world is going to be morally corrupt now as a consequence of Melko's rebellion. That Melko's rebellion is going to, is going to echo and it is going to have its echoes throughout the course of the story, throughout history. Um, um, 
but in the end that is going to that that's not going to succeed in altering the music in his despite but going to make still greater music well let's see what actually happens from this let's sort of look at this in action next week i can't possibly <laughs> make you go too much longer um we'll pick this up next time um i'll uh, what i the stuff that i want to go on and talk about um i want to look some at the valar um and at some of tolkien what what i sort of think of as some of tolkien's core myths uh the two trees of valinor are you know one of the essential elements which is most consistent and most dominant in Tolkien's thinking in the sense that it comes up all the time um you know the 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 tr the two trees of Valinor are almost as inescapable in Tolkien's mythology as the Silmarils um and of course they're connected um so I want to look at the birth of the trees certainly next time I want to think about the uh the Valar in general and how he characterizes them I'm gonna, I will I'll probably I'll try to go over that um, kind of quickly and then of course talk about the the children of Iluvatar and what we learn about them those were all things I was hoping to get to tonight but uh, we'll do those I hope with uh, admirable and ever-increasing efficiency next time and then we will uh, you know we will continue to move on and do uh, and, and do the next couple chapters um, so um, uh, yeah yeah um, This is why those of you who have done uh, several Mythgard Academy classes with me know that this always happens. And this is why I have, you'll notice if you look at the class schedule, there are several times when I have those bonus classes scheduled in with no assigned reading. This is one of the reasons I've I deliberately left myself a buffer here. Um, but uh, anyway, so let's, uh, but, but I would love for you guys uh, to kind of gather your thoughts about this. Um, I would like to, if you want to email me during the week, or if you would like to just, uh, um, you know, submit your your um, your observations at the beginning of class next time. I would love to hear from you what you found most striking about the way that the that the Valar uh, are depicted. Um, the the not necessarily any particular one of them, though you can certainly make points like that if you like, but just thinking of the Valar as, as, a, as a general category and the way, they're, the way that they're treated in the story. Think about that. Um, and uh, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll begin with that next time. Uh, uh, Timothy leaves me with this, uh, with this very encouraging thought uh, that uh, although I digress, digressed and did not uh, did not achieve my ultimate plan it's all to the greater glory and will redound to uh, a, a class which is far lovelier and mightier uh, uh, than I could have possibly planned um, let's hope that that in fact <laughs> turns out to be the case uh, Timothy but I make no claims uh, to have uh, the providential vision uh, of Iluvatar here uh, anyway, it's more. I agree, Jim. It's more like I'm fighting the long defeat. I think that's uh, that 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 strikes me as a little truer. Um, anyway, thanks everybody. Thanks for joining me, and I will see you guys next Tuesday. Good night now.